So this is a, a is, it's not an E63, it's a, so we're here at the Moto IQ garage with a really rare car that's really cool. It's so rare, I don't really know anything about it, but it's a Mercedes R63 wagon. I, I didn't even think they imported these in the United States, and I just found out they actually build them here. And we're here with Mike at Wystick, who actually built the car to take us on a tour. So what's going on, Mike? Tell us a little about this car. So this car is pretty special, it's pretty rare. There was only 100 of these cars made worldwide. They were only built in 2007. And of, of those 100, only 40 were in the United States. It's a very rare car, probably the rarest AMG ever built, production AMG. It's, it's a naturally aspirated 6.2. We manufacture the supercharger that bumps it up to the 700 horsepower it's making now. Uh, it's make, it makes roughly just under 500 horsepower, depending on the trim um, in its naturally aspirated form. Uh, is it uh, two-wheel drive or four-wheel drive? It's four-wheel drive. Uh, it has a seven-speed transmission, and this has our clutch upgrades, torque converter upgrades, and transmission pan upgrades to let it handle this power. So it's a conventional automatic as opposed to like a dual clutch? It's a conventional automatic. Uh, it has a torque converter and then seven, seven gears behind that. So this is a really cool car to begin with, but do you want to walk us through some of the trick stuff you did, like up on top? Like maybe, should we start with the motor? Let's start with the motor. So this is our stage two supercharger system. It's on top of the factory 6.2 liter naturally aspirated V8. It's a dual overhead cam V8. Um, that was in many Mercedes platforms during this era. So it was in C-Class all the way up to, you know, bigger chassis cars like this. Mm -hmm. It's kind of tucked under the firewall in this application. So it's hard to see all of it. Um, but this is our stage two system. It's a 2.3 liter twin screw supercharger uh, and everything that you see we manufacture, the belt drive and, and everything that goes with that to make, it, to make everything happen. Uh, it's a Whipple, right? It's Whipple screws, yes. And then everything else is, is manufactured by us. I, I know the uh, screw blowers have like really good efficiency compared to like a regular lobe type blower, right? They do. And we've been using twin screw for a while now. We have multiple stages, so we go even bigger than this as well. But this is what we run in our stage one and stage two for this platform. How much uh, boost pressure are you running? This right now being stage two, it drops a little bit because we added some exhaust, but it's roughly 12 PSI. Um, 12 PSI, and are you running a water-to-air intercooler? It's a water-to-air intercooler, and you can see the large, very large uh, heat exchanger unit up front that cools the, the water-to-air. Yeah, that's really big. Is it a dual or single pass? It's a single pass. Um, this is actually, we went even bigger. Normally, this is the core that we run in our SLS platform, mm -hmm. but we wanted extra cooling for, for this the half mile, so we put a little bit bigger core in. Um, normally, we mount them down lower, and they're a dual pass, but this is a, a single. And your intercooler bricks are sitting in the back part of the casting there? The intercooler's underneath the blower, so if you were to take, take the the, the screw unit off the top in the lower manifold, you would see uh, the intercooler set up and then the water comes out the back. This car is also currently running water methanol injection. So we have a tank that we've mounted in the back. And then if you look way in there, you can see we mounted the water meth nozzle um, specific, specifically to make this car run better um, on pump gas. And you uh, introduced the water methanol before the blower? We did on this application, normally like all of our turbocharger applications, we, we do everything a little bit differently. Normally, if we were gonna do a direct port, we would have pulled the whole blower off and went in each individual cylinder, but um, we added this on right before we went out there and that was the cleanest way to, to add the water methanol injection. Uh, I heard a lot of times if you introduce the water methanol before like a roots blower, you actually get an increase in boost pressure because it helps uh, rotor do. sealing. You do. It reduces the slip around the rotor, so you, you get more pressure delta uh, and let the outlet. Um, is that the control for the uh, water methanol right there? That is the control. We run an AEM controller. Um, that's what we use in all of our production systems as well. We manufacture all the other components, but we run the AEM controller. It's been really good to us and we sh shipped hundreds around the world so um, works really well. Uh, what size nozzle are you running on that? That is a single uh, 500 cc. Okay. Because it's a positive displacement blower it's in boost a lot not like a turbo car and we were worried about going through the 2.5 gallon tank pretty quickly so it's just a little bit a little bit of help on top of the 91 octane. Uh, we could have run you know dual thousand cc's uh, we would have been consuming it much quicker. 
Uh, are, so is the bottom end stock on this? It's a stock bottom end. The only thing we've done to this is we manufacture a head stud with ARP. So we've removed the OEM head bolts, put in the ARP 2000 head studs. Uh, but that's the only thing done to the motor itself. Uh, what compression ratio is the engine? It's a little under 12, which is really high for uh, a supercharged application, but with all the modern computing, what the power we're able to get out of that um, is pretty substantial with the boost and the high compression. Wow, 12 to 1 compression and 12 PSI. That's yeah, pretty... Yeah, it's making power. Yeah. Uh, are you running uh, ethanol or uh, flex fuel or anything? We're not. Uh, this currently has a stock fuel pump, stock, uh, stock fuel lines feeding it. It does have our billet rails and larger injectors. Um, but the fuel system is mostly stock, so we, we could upgrade that fuel system and go to E85. And we're already kind of talking about going to our stage three and maybe making a little bit more power. So uh, if 165 and a half and the half mile is not enough, then we'll, uh, we'll bump it up. And well, well, and your company is known for your ECU uh, reflashes and stuff. And uh, is that what you're running for engine management is a reflash stock ECU? Sure. This is an OEM ECU with our software on it. Oh. The stage one variant of this supercharger system is carb legal. So we have a carb EO number with, with the tuning and just our ECU tune alone on this platform is carb legal. Oh, that's nice. Um, I, I'm really impressed with this system. I, I mean, if you didn't know, I mean, it, it, would, it looks OEM. I mean, even like the details, like your custom hoses and um, your charge pipes and your castings. I mean, uh, it, it looks factory. Thank you, appreciate it. And you know, like I, my background is I'm an OEM engineer and we go through pains to design stuff and uh, you could see that level of detail here. The goal was always with every product that we manufacture at WiseTech is to have that OEM level of fitment. Uh, bolt in, it doesn't look like uh, you know, miscellaneous parts off eBay were thrown on there. It's, it's, a, it's a well thought out system. So uh, happy to hear that. Um, what kind of water pump are you using for the intercooler? So we normally run a CM30. Uh, I believe we're running a CM90 for this application because we do have a larger core. But we run a, a CM30 normally, three quarter in and out. Uh, is it thermostatically controlled, like, uh, like the speed, or do you just run it constant? We run it off ignition. Uh, we do have applications where we'll run it on a thermostat uh, to let the, motor get hot, let the motor get warm and hot, and then we'll kick it on. Although, in a supercharged application with air-to-water intercooler, cold is always better than hot, so we're not really worried about letting it get too hot. Uh, for your compressor bypass, does this have an internal bypass? It's an internal bypass. It's really tough to see, but if you go back there, there's a vacuum actuator on this side, and we manufacture the shaft and the butterfly valve and everything that goes between um, the positive pressure on the bottom and the, where the intercooler is to the air inlet. So it is a built-in bypass. And I guess like the Whipple, like um, some of the reasons why it's more efficient is the screw blower actually allows for internal compression, I guess, compared to like your typical roots that has the external compression in the manifold. Sure. I, I think that's the reason, right? It is. And, and the tolerance on this is a little bit tighter. There's different philosophies on both um, on what boost levels you added efficiency and, and heat and temperature. Um, but from our experience and what we've We've sold a lot of these, these superchargers around the world, and we've had really good results with the twin screw style. And I think I forgot to ask, but how much power and torque does it make? This is our stage two. It's making 700 horsepower right now as it sits. And that's all, that's, that's all wheel. 91 octane too, right? 91 octane plus the water methanol. So it just gives it a little bit of a little bump. Do you have a fail safe on the water uh, methanol? Like if you run out of water, does it go to a different map that saves the motor? We have that and we've put solenoids in. Sometimes that'll open the bypass valve or on a turbo car, you can have it open the wastegate. This car runs closed loop all the time. So it's constantly looking at the O2 sensors. We're adding that water methanol in an addition to, so we're not leaving out the map to rely on the extra fueling that the water meth is giving. So the car will lean itself out to hit the air fuel targets we want with the water meth. So if for some reason it was to fail, it would put the fuel back in very, very quickly to where there wouldn't be a problem. So we're not really relying on that for the fueling. That's totally awesome. Um, what do you want to look at next, the undercarriage or? Uh... We can look at the undercarriage. You can see the transmission, everything behind this that makes this all possible. Let's go check that out Let's then. So there's a lot of cool hardware under here. What's, what's going on, Mike? 
So it starts with the heart of everything down here is the transmission. So this is a seven speed Mercedes transmission that we manufacture clutches for, we modify the baskets and things like that. So everything has been done internally, cryogenically hardened parts inside of this transmission. It also has our torque converter uh, with a little bit higher stall. Um, the transmission pan underneath, we manufacture that. That's a much deeper sump than OEM with, with cooling fins. The OEM pan is a stamped steel pan that we're remove and we put this in place. One of, the, one of the neat things that we can do running this style pan is that we add external cooler ports mm -hmm. in and out. So there's the OEM transmission cooling circuit, which is through the pump to the front of the car, and we, we maintain that. Then we add an external pump on this application. This electric pump right electric here. Electric pump right here, and a little cooler further forward, and we have an independent loop right there. And there's fans on top of that blowing the air down. Okay, there's the fan, yeah. And this transmission's in a lot of different Mercedes platforms. Some of them are in a C-Class that are gonna do a road, road racing to where they'll, they don't have the room we have underneath this R-Class, but they'll put the pump and the cooler back behind the diff and, and they'll get more room to do that. But keeping the transmission temperatures under control are a major factor into longevity at, at this level. Uh, how much do you uh, raise the stall speed? It's only, so the stall speed varies depending on what car it's in. So being an, an SUV minivan style vehicle, it's already a little bit higher than it would be in a car. Uh, so this is only about three, 400 RPM. But when we're in there, we're also, we replace the lockup clutch and service everything so that everything's uh, fresh and brand new. Yeah, like I, I've seen the lockup clutches in a lot of OEM converters and it's almost like paper or cardboard or something. Yeah, and a lot of a lot of transmission, that's what it is. It's paper glued to steel mm -hmm. at the end of the day. That's the that's the friction material. And do you put like a semi-metallic material on there or like Kevlar or something? So it's still, it's still paper-based. Uh, it's just a, a different compound with different friction, uh, mu and things like that. And um, inside the transmission, what we're doing is we're taking, say we have, uh, a certain amount of clutch surface area, steel to clutch surface area. We go with a higher quality steel that's thinner. We go with a higher quality paper that's thinner. We can we modify the basket and we can get more disc, more disc, and we can get in some areas 200, 300 percent more surface area per clutch pack, um, and we can do it cooler at the same time. Uh, do you raise the uh, clamp pressure of the, of the servos in there and stuff? We we do. So there's a main line pressure solenoid. Um, that when you put it in comfort mode, comfort mode, sport mode, manual, that kind of adjusts the main line pressure of everything. The individual solenoids are more timing on, on uh, shift delay, but we do in our software and the OEM modes increase that line pressure. That's so, everything's like really well thought out and everything matches the, uh, the power. So it's almost like a OEM kind of thinking, right? Exactly. and and. This is, this is a direct OEM replacement, a lot of these parts that you see. This one, we, we kind of have some dedicated parts here to go a little bit faster, but the core of all these products are our, our uh, OEM replacement bolt-on parts. And uh, looks like you have some pretty cool headers up there. Anything you want to talk about those? Those are, so those are a four to one, two inch primary, uh, and then it's a four to one into a three inch. Uh, and then we, it's all American 304 stainless, high quality, um, all the way back to an OEM muffler. So at the rear axle back here, there's the OEM muffler after our X-pipe is where it attaches. Have you found that the OEM mufflers are pretty low restriction? They are very low restriction, especially in these AMG models. Uh, AMG and a lot of the OEM manufacturers nowadays, they're spending a lot of time getting that perfect sound, the perfect flow. It's, the quality is always great, obviously, in an OEM component. So um, we're noticing not much of a, a gain changing the muffler and um, it still sounds great. And uh, it looks like you have some uh, high flow cats here. Are these sure. like the metallic 200 cell cores? So those are those are actually a 400 cell to keep it, to Low keep it, uh, yeah, and to, and to keep it, you know, kind of compliant. So that's that's uh, that's why those are in there. And uh, you have a Y pipe. We have a X pipe. Fairly uh, long. Yeah, X pipe. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Fairly long X, just because of the the conditions we have back here on the width. Um, but yeah, it's, it's three inch tubes into this. X and then into the OEM exhaust in the back. Have you found that that improves your uh, bottom end torque? It does and it substantially changes the exhaust tone. So the difference between a longer X, a shorter X, an H pipe, uh, playing, playing with those, we can, we can shift the exhaust tone um, quite a bit. And uh, you were saying that this is the OEM suspension um, 
It's a uh, Bilstein with airbags. It's Bilstein with airbags, and Bilstein, uh, Bilstein set a brand new set out for this for this car for this build, and we appreciate that. And so all four corners have new Bilstein components. It is a McPherson style shock through the bag in the front, and then back here we have uh, the bag and a separate shock. And uh, you could tell that these are like very special brakes. I mean, they look like the Brembo GT calipers, like the monoblocks and- uh, They are. Really big two-piece rotors. Yep, big two-piece rotors. Uh, these are the, the Brembo GTR billet calipers that are all the nickel plated. So, um, that's yeah, a really special, special car. $10,000 worth of calipers there. It's a lot, a lot in calipers. But with the speeds that this car was hitting, having and the weight that this car is having reliable braking was was very important so you know like um doing these kind of things i, I get to see like a, a lot of really trick cars and a lot of race cars but um i really appreciate oem type engineering and uh really good oem integration and that's what we have here and i think that's actually really exceptional i, I really appreciate that yeah and, and you'll have to take a look at some of the other builds we do turbocharger platforms where uh, a lot of OEM integration bolt in, and, and that's the goal with everything we do at Weistech is an OEM level. Um, you know, a lot of, all of our ECU tuning is, is emissions compliant, our stage one stuff. So doing it on a different level than the average tuner. Right, and um, you know, like my background is OEM engineering, and I keep on telling like a lot of my racer friends and car customizers, and I said, you guys have no idea how much engineering and how much thought goes into the stock stuff that you just throw away. Oh, yeah. And it's gotta last, it's gotta last a certain amount of time, and I mean, imagine a warranty claim on thousands of cars at an OEM level, it's, it's, a, it's a big number. That, that's what I tell them. I mean, like if they have a recall or, um, you know, like you have to have, warranties are long nowadays, you know, up to 100,000 miles, and uh, you have to have Six Sigma reliability for 100,000 miles, and it has to be cheap. Yep, exactly. And yeah, lean on the vendors, right? <laughs> Well, and when I see this and like how clean everything is integrated, I mean, I, I really appreciate this kind of work. Thank you, I appreciate that. Let's go look at some other stuff. Let's do it. So Mike, I see my buddy Tanner Faust is driving this and um, there's all kinds of stickers on here and it's obvious this car came from an event. Can you, can you tell me what, what, what kind of event and what did you have to do for it? Sure, we just got back from the Sand Hills Open Road Challenge in Arnold, Nebraska. It was the first time that I had ever been there, but it was a great event. It's an open road rally that has both a half mile and a mile event. And uh, Cam Douglas from Optima has been doing that for years and kind of was really uh, there from the forefront. And I'm sure he would have a lot of thoughts to talk about. That. Sure, get out of my way. Let's <laughs> talk about this. So, um, <laughs> one of the greatest events um, in the country that's kind of unknown because they're sold out every year is the, um, called the Sand Hills Open Road Challenge. And it's a wonderful grassroots event that should be on everybody's bucket list if they know what's going on uh, in the automotive world. And what it is, is it, it's a, a place in Nebraska, Arnold, Nebraska, where they block off highway and you're allowed to uh, run at obviously speeds that are much higher than the normal speed limit. And it's a rally. You go 26 miles up, 27 miles back, and you try to hit a perfect time. But in addition to that, the day before, they have a standing half mile and a standing mile. And so this car is all stickered up for both of those events. I got to drive. See, I'm second fiddle here. Oh, like right under Tanner. I got to drive with my brother-in-law, Tom Olswang. We got to drive in the road rally. And then some guy, we, friend we found on the side of the road, decided that um, he would do the mile for us. So um, Tanner um, graciously accepted and, and had a lot of fun with this car. You know, I mean, he's, if you know him, he's a joker, right? So well, you got to be careful with that guy about, you know, him messing up your car. So good thing it was just going in the straight yeah. line because, you know, if there was turns, I, I, I don't know about yeah, your car. Yeah, man. drifting an all-wheel drive van, I mean, he probably would, right? Or jumping or something. So, um, yeah, just I, I gave him a little strip of, um, you know, mile and a half, little area to slow down. Yeah, and even he could get that right. Yeah, so he, and he did a great job. So he set the time for the world's fastest minivan for standing mile, um, world's fastest street legal minivan, so. Uh, how fast was that? 165.5 miles an hour, 
um, in not great conditions. Obviously, the road is, it, it's a highway with a crown on it and cornfields on the side. I mean, it's not an airstrip. Um, and the uh, DA, I think, was like 78.95, so it's like, you know, it, it wasn't great. We're hoping to get in the 170s in the car, the way it sits, and maybe even go higher from there. So uh, did you have any aerodynamic stability things going on, or was this thing pretty dead straight? So I didn't drive it at that speed, but I have been close to that, and it feels very planted. But when you start getting that to that speed, it, it's a little soft, and you can see when, you know, we'll share the video with you guys, but you can see when he crosses the finish line, that car, it's moving up and down a little bit. So as stiff as it is right now, it's 5,300 pounds. And when it hits a little dip in the road, I mean, it still moves. Um, so you had to do some special prep for safety and stuff to the interior. Yep. Uh, yep. Let's go check that out. Yeah, for sure. So to run at that speed, you had to upgrade some of your safety stuff. And I see some Sparco seats and harnesses. Uh, yeah. You want to talk about that a little? Yeah, so for in order for us to tech for um, the, the different speed classes at Sand Hills, they require some safety equipment. And in addition to that, obviously we want to we didn't want to put uh, Tanner in harm's way. The rest of the guys on there don't really matter, but the... Um, the well, he's just a steering wheel casket, and there's <laughs> plenty of those where he came from, so I wouldn't worry about Tanner too much. Well, he, he said I had to do a couple things, so anyway, we wanted to, wanted to make him happy. Um, so yeah, but they require a few things anyway. So one um, is a fire extinguisher, and the other one's harnesses. In order to put in harnesses, we had to do seats, because the... The factory AMG seats are nice, but they're more for comfort than they are for what we're intending it to do. So, yeah, six-point um, harness, harnesses and uh, with a submarine belt, and uh, the, um, uh, we had to modify uh, these really nice um, Sparco seats. I mean, they're carbon fiber articulating seats. They're their top of the line. I wish I could remember the name of them, but Warren over at Sparco helped us out. Um, and put, helped us with a uh, good deal on those. Mike at WiseTech again uh, made the seat brackets custom made so they fit perfectly and um, you know adjust well for both my uh, big rear end and Tanner's smaller uh, body. Anyway, we'll leave it at that. The uh, <laughs> the um, uh, fire extinguisher, Sparco fire extinguisher up front underneath the passenger side. And that's kind of it for the, the um, safety stuff. We did take out the second row seats for the race because the harness is mount in there. But now that we're driving, we converted it back into a kind of daily driving mode. Uh, is this a fire extinguisher or a fire system? Fire extinguisher, not a full system. So again, we're trying to compromise here for a daily driver and something you can go out and and set the record like we did, but we didn't want to compromise the daily driving capability. I mean, we just drove it 30 miles here on the freeway, and we had a nice conversation, had a couple conference calls, and you know, we could have had four kids yelling in the back as well, or you know, to, or excuse me, five because it's seven passenger, um, and uh, and it works like a car, like a minivan, right? Wow, I mean, this is really nice. I mean, I really like that seat bracket. Um, a lot of those seat bracket adapters are like really, really bad. Yeah. And, but that one's like clean, good welds, really strong. It looks probably stronger than the OEM hardware. Um, is that a regular production piece? So we have a regular production seat bracket that's a fixed bracket that's super lightweight. We made this custom one-off for this with the sliders. So it has, an, it has a, the Sparco slider to the brackets that we made. Um, so direct bolt into OEM and um, yeah, bolt in product. But you know, we, we were kind of joking about maybe there's a maybe there's a need for a, a production version of this. So that might happen down the pipeline. An R63 Sparco seat adapter. Adapter for all right. 40 of them. For the all States. 40, the, right. yeah, and none of them are wrecked, by the way, or rusted <laughs> away, right? So anyway, and they all want to modify them. Yes. <laughs> So one of the things I noticed, it's such a subtle thing that most people wouldn't even catch, but I, at first I go, oh, like stock wheels. But then I looked really closely and I could see that their stock wheels have been modified to be modular. 
and there's probably a cool story behind that. So what's up with the wheels? Well, I'm, I, I'm, I'm kind of an AMG fan, and I like the, um, the original monoblock style. I think that's a defining element of uh, the AMG cars, and I think wheels always make the car, right? So whether you like my choice or not, that can be debatable, but I like them. Um, and I like monoblocks, and I like monoblocks on every Mercedes ever made. I put them on some modern cars. Um, but the idea was, and, and what we did was, we took an original monoblock, an 18 monoblock, 18 inch monoblock off of an E55 210 sedan, and then um, had Mike at WiseTech scan it. Yeah, we, we took our ferro arm, we 3D scanned the, the stock wheel, and we took that, and, and keeping the scale the way it needed to be in the curvature, made it bigger and, and, and designed these wheels. So this is uh, like CNC billet from a digitized model. From a digitized model. So this is a full custom wheel that's been uh, carefully designed uh, so you can get the offset and the width you want, um, but it looks like an OEM AMG wheel. Yeah, and you know they're my personal wheels, so I actually put AMG on it. But when we were at uh, SEMA, we had some people from Mercedes that were looking at it kind of funny, like they wanted to talk to whoever made these wheels. Right? <laughs> so the licensing department's going to give you a nasty yeah, gram, maybe. To give me a call again. I just used them for personal use, and I'm not I'm not selling these. So. Um. What's really cool is that, uh, well, you like the monoblock wheels, and these are modular, but they're very carefully designed to look like monoblocks. Right. And at first it looks just like a stock wheel, but then it, you, if you, you look at it and you go, oh, man, there's some thought that's been put in these. And that's like a really interesting story. Yeah, and I'm not sure if they ever made a 21 in a monoblock. I think they might have for some of the... Um, 90s bigger sedans, um, but um, but I'm not sure. I couldn't find any, and definitely not in this offset. So, yeah, that's incredible attention to detail, like the whole car. So I, I know that you wanted to go 170. So what are your plans to do that next year? Well, hopefully this year we'll be able to do that in better conditions with the car the way it is. But we also know that. Um, and we've gotten a lot of flack because people, you know, have their own fast minivan and they've done some other records. There's some guys in Colorado, there's another guy in, in uh, Riverside, and um, they make some pretty fast stuff. So they may be coming out to, you know, undo our record, which is fine because um, we're looking forward to that and then taking it to the next level. But I can tell you that's well beyond what I can do, and that's why I got Mike to partner with at Wise Tech, and so he can tell you about stage three. So the next step with this car would be going to our stage three system. It's a bigger three liter uh, twin screw supercharger system. So there's more parts that we can throw at this car. We can run an 85, and there's more things that we can do to the motor to make that, that handle it. So um, we, we believe that this car should do 170 in the right conditions as is, um, but we have some more parts that we can throw at it uh, to go even faster. So you could just go to do a straight E85 can, or are you going to actually have flex fuel and tap into the can box? We can actually do flex fuel on these vehicles. Uh, there's a multiple ways of doing it. Uh, a lot of them run like a GM style uh, ethanol sensor and, and shifts to lambda uh, on the ECU from, from whatever that needs to do. So there's multiple ways of doing that, but we would maybe have a race spec and then the way that it would drive on the street. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, but that's, that's what we can do next uh, if we want to push it even further. Man, like uh, when you do stage three, let's maybe we can go to your shop and see see it go into the car and actually look at the hardware. That'd Great. be really yeah, cool. We can do that. We convert the whole front of the motor. Currently, it's a six rib OEM six rib. We convert the whole front of the motor to an eight rib to to handle all this the, the bigger drive and and everything. So it's a pretty pretty neat package that we've developed for it. And the uh, Mercedes motors are really stout. That's what I've heard. They really are. And this is currently a stock bottom end, but. We do manufacture a, a forged rod and, and piston for it, so um, yeah, we'll, we'll see if we'll see if we go to that step. But it's it's an option if we want to go faster. So there's one thing we forgot: the livery on the car and why it looks like this. Yeah. So we took a, an original photo of um, 
uh, the Red Pig, which is a very famous AMG car that was ran in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, they took a 300 SEL 6.3 and made that car into a race car. I mean, it was the S-class of that era, right? And they won, and they surprised a lot of people. Um, that's kind of what was, you know, an iconic start for AMG. So we liked that livery and kind of transferred it onto this car. So there's a lot of those similar sponsors and the similar look and feel to that older um, livery, which, you know, you can love it or leave it, but we kind of thought it was cool to have that tie-in. Mike, what, what were some of the logos? What did they mean? Like, this so the, one was the, a camel logo. This one was a camel cigarette logo, which can't have tobacco logo, so we, we shamelessly put white second engineering there. Uh, and the, but the Bosch, the Castrol, the Bilstein, these are all original Levi's. These are all original sponsors that were on the Red Pig that we uh, made made vinyl and, and threw on this car to have it kind of. Yeah, even the Optima logo here has um, the similarities to the original one. It was looked kind of like a posted stamp, so we took some creative license there. I'm sure my logo department will probably shame me, but um, <laughs> I like it, so. So here we go, folks, the world's fastest minivan, uh, and it's about to get faster. Uh, we're gonna go to WiseTech while that's getting done, and we're gonna actually see how it's done, get to see the hardware, that's really exciting. So thank you, WiseTech, thank you, Optima, for letting us have a good look at this, and there'll be more to come. Okay, can I have the last word? Can I have the last word? All right, because we forgot one important part okay. that you can't see in this car. Okay. Notice the logo. We do have an Optima, brand new Optima yellow top battery, uh, but it's right underneath the passenger seat, and there, it would take us a half an hour even to get a peek at it. But it is a brand new Optima H7. It's a prototype for a battery that we're launching this year. Is that the square one without the spiral cells? Correct. It's the new uh, Pure Flow plate design. So, um, and it performed flawlessly and hopefully it'll get us home. I, I, I need one of those for my Tundra because I got a oh, yellow yeah. top in there and it's been in there for like five years. So. Keep it going. Yeah, but I, I want one of the square ones because the square ones look cool. Okay. <laughs> so if you like this video and you want to see more of them, subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out MotoIQ.com for more editorial content.